Good morning, everybody. I had my radio on too loud up here, and it was causing feedback. Sorry about everybody who heard a little squeak. But glad that you're here. Good morning. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So if you're just joining us here in the parking lot, there are calls to worship down there by the offering box. Um, but you can also find our call to worship at Bethel Covenant. Dot org and click on the bulletin there. If you don't know, I am Pastor Adam, and I pastor the Covenant Church, but we have been doing these combined Covenant and Moravian Church services for a long time. Our first one was Easter of last year, so most of this COVID season, and it has been a blessing. Pastor Andrew is on vacation this week. He is down in Juneau. Uh, I know that I texted him yesterday or a couple days ago, and he was skiing, so he's, he's enjoying a very well-deserved break. Well, let's do our call to worship this morning, and the call to worship comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 19 specifically, and uh, that is one of our lectionary readings for the day. So Psalm 19, I'll read the part that says leader and invite you to read along with the people. And even if you are joining us via Facebook or uh, Zoom or the recording, I encourage you to do that from your own homes as well. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are their words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I invite you to pray with me. Dear Father God, I thank you for how you did create everything, that you, even in the midst of blizzards and storms, in the midst of the great wind that we have today, that you have made all of creation, and it speaks to your goodness, it speaks to your power. Lord, I pray that we would worship you today because we recognize that, that we would worship you today because we recognize what you have done in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would Help us to see you and hear you in every song, and as we open up your word to the book of John today, Lord, just speak to us and help us to listen and obey. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'll invite you now to turn your gaze towards the bottom left window. I know that it's a little bit hard to see, especially with this lighting, but there is a Moravian choir down there that will be leading us in worship today.
Praise God. That music was beautiful. And I'm so glad that the Moravian Choir has been leading every other week. It has been a blessing to to sing and worship along with them. And uh, I trust that you are doing that wherever you are as well. Well, once again, welcome to the church service if you have just joined us since uh, last I was up here. Um, Today is the third Sunday in the season of Lent. And as Pastor Andrew likes to remind me, Sundays are not actually a part of Lent. They are separate from Lent. It is a day of celebration, but it does land in the middle of the season of Lent. So this is the third Sunday during the season of Lent. And um, before we dive into God's Word, John chapter 2, we have a few announcements from the Covenant Church, um, as well as some prayer requests. So you can always find the announcements by going to BethelCovenant.org and click on the bulletin button there. But here are a few announcements. Um, If you are interested in helping out Winter House, Winter House moved back to the Covenant Church while they are working on their new kitchen in their new location. Uh, But they are still looking for meals. There's not a ton of people who've signed up for the meal train. So if you're interested in bringing a meal for 25 to 50 people, um, we would love your help. You can sign up by going to BethelCovenant.org, or you can go also on Facebook. There's a meal train sign up there as well. And we'd love to have some help with that so that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus um, to folks that are in need. The Covenant Church has a board meeting coming up on the 22nd, March 22nd at 6.30, and we do have open board meetings, so if anybody would like the Zoom link to that board meeting, please let us know. Uh, But especially if you are a Covenant Church member, um, we are looking for two people to fill two open positions that will be open after this summer. Uh, on our board. So if you are a member, um, consider praying about whether you might be one, you might be willing to do that, or if you know of anybody else who would be good, uh, feel free to nominate them. And you can contact me or board chair Eli Jacobson uh, or also Elizabeth Jacobson if you have any nominees. Also, we continue to do our family uh, life groups, and so we have a family-friendly life group on Sunday evenings. We have a parenting group on Zoom, 8 to 9. Uh, We have a women's Bible study on Wednesdays at 6.30, and a men's Bible study Thursdays at 7.30. And if you'd like any of the information for those, they are all available Uh, via Zoom as requested, uh, and some of those do also meet in person, though not all of them do. Um, Also, we have Sunday school over at our church building at uh, 945, and all are welcome to join that. Again, that's both in person and Zoom. Uh, We are hoping to restart volunteer choir after a few weeks off, so if you're interested in joining our volunteer choir, we are still hoping to do the UPIC version of How Great Thou Art. So keep your eyes open for that. If you are interested in joining, please let me know and I'll get you the information for that. Lastly, if you are, uh, if you are feeling led to give financially to if tithes or offerings, there is that offering box down here in this parking lot. But if you're not here in person, you can give at BethelCovenant.org or you can go to Facebook, find Bethel Covenant Church or find Bethel Moravian Church and you can give through the Facebook pages there as well. And at this time, we're going to move into a time of prayer. Uh, Again, we have our prayer requests for the Covenant Church on BethelCovenant.org, so you can check those out. And so we're going to go ahead and pray for those prayer requests right now. Dear Father God, I thank you for how you have given us safety and shelter. And Lord, as the wind blows outside, that uh, we can see the effects of the wind even as we are safe within our vehicles or our homes or wherever we may be. And Lord, it's just a good reminder of how the Holy Spirit is compared to the wind, that you can see the effects of the wind even if you cannot physically actually see the wind. And the Holy Spirit is working inside the heart of every believer, and we might not see the actual physical Holy Spirit, but we see 
the work of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to see that and to, uh, to desire that. And Lord, that we would listen and obey to the Holy Spirit's prompting in our lives. And so, Lord, we also lift up these prayer requests that have been brought before you uh, by the church congregation. Lord, we pray uh, specifically for Susie as uh, she has an MRI uh, Lord, we pray for wisdom for the doctors and uh, the people that are looking at that MRI that they would know the cause of her pain. Lord, we pray for Peggy Moses, uh, especially as she has uh, gone into the emergency surgery this morning due to um, blood loss. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you would be with the surgeons and Lord, that you would guide them and that you would bring Peggy back to us here in Bethel uh, safe and sound after her recovery. Lord, we pray for Eddie as uh, he has been dealing with problems with his gallbladder and probably has to go to Anchorage to have it removed. Lord, we just pray that you would give him peace and his wife peace as they deal with all of those logistics that you'll be with uh, the doctors and the nurses. And Lord, that, um, that even through this trial that your glory would be shown. Lord, we pray for Evelyn, uh, pray with Evelyn who asked for prayer for Anna. Lord, we pray for healing and for comfort. Lord, we pray for traveling mercies for Kathy as she goes to Anchorage for medical. Lord, we pray for Pearl as she continues to do nursing school. Lord, continue to help her to do well and to glorify your name uh, as she does the best that she can. Lord, we pray for Carly and uh, for mental health and for the Lord's provision for, uh, for Carly and the whole family. Lord, we pray for Giffa as he continues to struggle with cancer. Lord, we just pray for supernatural healing. Lord, we pray that you would be the great physician who lays your healing hand upon him. And Lord, that most of all, that they would know you and love you and serve you as Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray for Tabitha as she uh, is scheduled to have uh, her baby girl on 315. Lord, we just pray for a safe and healthy baby and mother and lord that that whole family would glorify you as they've had a long long uh, hard pregnancy during this covid season lord i pray that you'll be with each of us as we open up your word lord that you would speak to us and that we would uh, that we would be changed by it lord that you would help us to truly look at our own lives and see what it is that you want us to change what you want us to do what you want us to get rid of Lord, how you want us to, um, to better be your servants on this earth to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, so if you have your Bibles or if you have your phone with a Bible on it, you can open up to John chapter 2, as I've already mentioned a couple times today. And we are in John chapter 2, specifically verses 12 through 25. And that is a story of Jesus that appears to be uh, at the beginning of his ministry as he goes into Jerusalem and he goes into the temple. And it's interesting that we have Easter time coming up and we have Lent right before Easter and how that really lines up here in Alaska with another big gathering event that happens every year. And there are some similarities, though some very big differences, but I think that we in Alaska can probably kind of visualize a little bit of the crowds that come together. You see, today is the start of the Iditarod. And I don't know how many of you follow that down here. Um, before we served here in Bethel, we served as a family in Uniclete, which is a mile 700 on the Iditarod Trail. And I also lived out in Nome and served the Covenant Church out there. Uh, and we also lived in Anchorage for a couple of years. So we know a little bit about Iditarod frenzy, as, uh, as some people call it. And people often get really, really into the Iditarod. And it's an exciting thing. We, of course, down here have the K300, which is our big race. And it's, a, and it's an exciting thing. We have fireworks here. We have a little party. But if you've ever been in Anchorage during the ceremonial start of the Iditarod during Fur Rondi, you know it gets 
wild and crazy. It's not just a small gathering, it is a huge gathering, which is of course why they canceled it this year due to COVID. But other years, if you were to go to 4th and 5th Avenue there in Anchorage during uh, Fur Rondi during the ceremonial start, you would see people lined up as far as you can see in either direction. People who have come from near and far, not just from Alaska, but people that come from outside in the lower 48, even people from around the world, they gather in Anchorage at this time of year for Fur Rondi in the beginning of the Iditarod. And of course, there's lots of crazy things that happen with that. There's outhouse races. There's running of the reindeer. Of course, we they have the ceremonial start where people get a pay to ride in the baskets of the sled dogs. Um, it's, uh, it's quite an event. So we in Alaska, we can kind of picture what it looks like to have an event where people come from near and far and that there's a sea of people. And that is, uh, that is similar to how it was in Jesus' time for the Passover. Now, they wouldn't have had quite as many wild and crazy things going on, but there certainly were things that were, um, were perhaps too wild and crazy that were so different from what God wanted that Jesus had to come and kind of do a little bit of correction. Uh, but um, it was not uncommon for little Jerusalem back then to have as many as 500,000 people come from all over the region to go worship God during Passover. And Jerusalem at that time was not that big. Basically, that was three times the population of Jerusalem. So uh, even more than those that come for Fur Rondi, even more than come to Bethel at any time, there was a massive amount of people that would have come to Jerusalem during Passover. And if you follow the church year, we are actually approaching Passover here. Passover happens the week before Easter, uh, and Passover was, of course, the celebration of how Moses, he told the people to paint the blood of the lamb on their doorposts so that the angel of the Lord would pass over their homes, and those who did not do that, of course, lost their firstborn child. And so they remember how God had mercy and passed over them. And in the same way, we as Christians, we recognize Jesus was that Passover lamb. He is the one who was our ultimate sacrifice. He gave his life for ours. And so the, the whole season of Lent is focused on Jesus and what he did. And it's kind of modeled after the 40 days that Jesus spent in the desert, in the wilderness, preparing his heart for ministry. And in the season of Lent, we prepare our hearts and minds for Easter. And we are supposed to look at how, is, how does God want to use us? And as we go through the season of Lent, we, we recognize God's image in creation. We recognize our own mortality, that <clears throat> this is not our home. <clears throat> Excuse me, that, that we are bound for the promised land if we know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So we recognize Jesus and how we needed his sacrifice and death. We needed his blood to be passed over so that we do not face the punishment of sin. And we also recognize, as we will today, that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. You know, it's the enemy, it's Satan who wants to make you feel guilty. When you mess up, when you sin, Satan wants you to feel guilty and wants you to basically hate yourself. But that's not God's design. The Holy Spirit convicts us. He lets us know that what we are doing is wrong, but he gives us a way out. Follow Jesus and accept his forgiveness and walk in the newness of life. And so the Holy Spirit convicts us to repent, to turn away from our sins, and to live a redeemed life, not to stay in a life of depression and of guilt, but God wants us to repent and be redeemed, to be restored. So with that in mind, we look at John chapter 2, starting in verse 12. After this, he, that being Jesus, after this, he went down to Capernaum where, with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there 
for a few days. So this is right after Jesus at the wedding turned water into wine, Jesus' first public miracle. But of course, it was in a small group. It was maybe like in the group that we have gathered here in the parking lot. This small group, Jesus revealed himself to a wedding party, but he had not yet revealed himself to, say, all of Bethel, to all of Jerusalem, to all of Israel. But he was about to do that very soon and in a big way. So, verse 12, after he uh, had done the miracle at, in Cana, he went then onward. Verse 13, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Now, if you know this story, you knew where this was going. But if you have not heard this story before, this is a shocking story. So often we think of Jesus as that peaceful lamb. When we think of Psalm 23 and think about how uh, the Lord is our shepherd, we often think about how Jesus is that peaceful shepherd who brings us beside still waters, who restores our soul. And certainly that is true. But here in John chapter 2, we see Jesus, who is not just simply a passive, calm, peaceful lamb, we see Jesus, who is like the lion of the tribe of Judah. And we see Jesus making a whip with cords and driving people out of the temple. And this was not just a small group, a small gathering. This was during the Passover. This is where literally hundreds of thousands of Jews had gathered in Jerusalem. The temple was packed all day long during Passover and Jesus went in there, and he overthrew tables. He emptied out money coins. He drove out the sheep and the oxen with a whip. And just as an interesting little, uh, little aside there, the, the Greek there is a little bit uncertain. You know, sometimes we think in, of the story that Jesus whipped people to get them out, but it's not 100% certain if that he actually whipped people but he definitely whipped the animals. He drove the oxen and the sheep out, and maybe he also whipped people. We don't actually know for sure based off of the Greek, but I think that it is, regardless, a good word of caution to us. You see, the problem was that the temple had become corrupt. The temple had become a place not of worship, not of prayer, but had become a place, specifically here in John chapter 2, Jesus says, take those things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And you see, the people had made the temple a house of profit. They had made it a house of profit. Um, see, there was the money changers who, uh, according to good Jewish tradition, if you were to bring an offering... If just like here, if you were to put an offering in the offering box, according to good Jewish tradition, you could not give any money that had anybody's face on it. So if you have any money in your wallet that has a George Washington, that has a Benjamin Franklin, it has somebody's face on it, then the rules at that time were to be a good Jew, you don't give any of that money. And we know, of course, Jesus, he famously said, whose picture is on the coin that you have? And that picture was Caesar. And Jesus said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. And so the good Jews at that time, they actually had to take the money that they had that was from the various places, whether they were Roman citizens, whether they um, came all the way from Ethiopia, wherever they came from, they brought their own currency and they traded it with the money changers so that they could have the temple 
currency, a pure currency that didn't have anybody's face on it, that was meant to worship God. So it was, there was good thought behind it. The heart behind it originally perhaps was to really point to God, but somewhere down the line, it became corrupt. It became a money-making venture. See, the money changers at those times, they weren't necessarily in it to help people worship. Instead, what they wanted is they wanted to go into the temple and gain something for themselves. Have we ever come to church wanting to gain something for ourselves rather than worshiping God? Well, Jesus certainly had things to say and do about that that day. Likewise, the people who were selling animals, were selling the oxen or the sheep or the pigeons, they likewise had turned it into a place where they were coming to make a profit. Um, so just like the money changers, they were charging fees. The people that were selling animals that were needed for sacrifice, they were charging fees. And uh, we don't actually know from this story whether the money changers or the animal sellers were making, uh, making crooked profit, which was often the case, like the tax collectors who they pocketed some for themselves and then gave to, uh, gave to the authorities. It doesn't actually say whether these money changers or these sacrifice, sacrificial animal sellers were making an immoral profit. But what is clear is that they were seeking to make a profit. They were seeking to not have the temple be a house of worship, but rather a house of trade. So they entered into the temple seeking their own profit. And I, I am guilty, as probably some of you are. Whenever church is done, um, I've sometimes turned to my wife and said, how did you like worship today? And how did you like church today? I don't know if you've ever asked that question of some other person. And it's not necessarily a bad question, but it can misdirect you. It can be a distraction if you're not focusing on the right thing. Because, see, the question is asking about your own personal likes. Did I like church today? Well, it's not actually about me. If I go to church looking for if I like church, then I've already got it backwards. Instead, our question should be, did God like church today? Do you think God was pleased with the songs today? Do you think God was pleased with the sermon today? Do you think God is pleased with us as we seek to put God's word into practice? You see the difference there? It's focusing on yourself or focusing on God. And Jesus, he went into the temple that day, and what he saw was people that were focused on themselves, focused on making a profit, focused on what do I get out of this worship gathering. It reminds me of a quote that I saw once of a worship leader who was talking to somebody in the congregation and the person came up to them and said, I didn't like worship today. And the worship leader said, that's okay. We weren't worshiping you. And that's, a, that's an important thing for us to get right as we go into the house of God. As we start thinking about going back into the church building, as uh, coronavirus hopefully is winding down, we're definitely seeing the numbers go down here in Bethel, and we're very thankful for that. But the point is, if we are entering into worship seeking our own profit, we are in danger of being whipped. Because Jesus is going to help drive out all the distractions, just as he did here. And if we're standing in the way, <laughs> this particular passage is unclear whether people got in the way and were whipped as Jesus was whipping the, pe the, whipping the animals out of the temple. And I think it's important for us to try to make sure that our hearts are in the right place as we come to worship as well. So once again, John chapter 2, going back to there, I'm going to read again verses 15 through 17. So Jesus, he made a whip of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. 
To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Now, it's an interesting thing. At the beginning of this sermon, I pointed out that this story is directly connected to immediately after Jesus did the miracle of turning water into wine at the wedding, he went then with his brothers and his mother and disciples to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. In the book of John, this is one continuous event. And if you were to follow the whole book of John, it's interesting because this happens at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. But if you were to look at the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's a similar story that happens at the end of Jesus's ministry. And I'm going to go ahead and read those real quick. Luke chapter 19, 45 through 46. And he, Jesus, entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. So interesting here. Jesus drove the people out, but he said different words here in Luke than he did in John. Remember, John said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's household or house into a market. Jesus was giving them a warning. He was giving them an admonishment. But here in Luke, he says, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Jesus here is not just coming to give them a gentle or not so gentle, hey, get it right. He's saying, no, you got it wrong this time. And different words, not just money, not just a market, but you've made it a den of robbers. Matthew 21, 12 through 13 is likely the same story. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. So same words there. Also again in Mark eleven fifteen through 18, this is a little bit longer of likely the same story. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the temples of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, it is, not, is it not written, my house shall be a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. So we see here two very different stories. They're similar, but they have very different details. And so there are some people who think that the stories in John, Luke, Matthew, and Mark are all actually the same story, but it really doesn't make any sense. There are different details, and some people say, well, John just had it out of order. How could John, who is an eyewitness, the beloved disciple of Jesus, gotten it wrong? I do not believe that he got the timing wrong. Instead, I believe that it's pretty clear. The book of John is chronological. There are actually three different Passovers that are specifically mentioned in the book of John, and maybe a fourth one, but specifically there's three Passovers for sure mentioned. And if you know the history of Jesus's ministry, we know that he did public ministry for how many years? One, two, three years. And so if he were to have started his ministry with a Passover, his public ministry with a Passover, and he ministered for three years, he actually probably would have had four Passovers with the disciples. The first Passover, two in the middle, and then one at the very end. So it seems like it's pretty clear the first Passover here in John, he went to clear the temple. And that's what he wants to do with us as well. When we first get to know Jesus, he wants us to look inside of our hearts and inside of our lives and say, what is it that needs to be cleaned up? And sometimes it's a painful process as Jesus makes a whip and has to clean out some of the nasty sins in our lives. But he doesn't want to just have that be it. Certainly that is the once and for all when we surrender to Jesus Christ, he comes into our hearts and we, uh, we follow him with the Holy Spirit living inside of us, but we live a life 
of constantly becoming more like Jesus, constantly giving up more sins in our lives. And so I really think that Jesus here in the Gospels cleaned the temple out at least twice. So once at the beginning and once at the end. And who knows, maybe he actually made this an annual tradition. I don't know for sure, but um, it's certainly possible that Jesus often would go in uh, and he would clean the temple. When's the last time that you asked Jesus to come in and clean out some of the junk in your life? Some of the things that were distracting you from worshiping God. God's desire is that we regularly purify our hearts. What is it that we need to let Jesus drive out of our lives so that we can worship God with that space that we've been filling with other things? So it's interesting that during Lent, we get ready for the Passover, and for the Passover meal, that final supper, the last supper that Jesus shared with his disciples, during that during that time, there is a great ceremony. If you've never been to a Passover meal, a Seder meal, really encourage you to check it out sometime. Uh, but it's a long meal. It's not just everybody sits down at a table and eats and then goes about their own business. There's a, there's a worship service that goes along with it. And part of it, there is a children's message, a children's uh, portion of the Passover meal. And the children are given this job. The children must go search the entire house for any chametz, which is uh, basically any, any leavened anything. So whether it be crumbs or bread or uh, yeast, whatever has leaven in it. They're supposed to go find everything that has leaven in it, and they're supposed to gather it up during the Passover meal, and they are supposed to take it and then dispose of it. In fact, um, the Orthodox, Orthodox Jews still do that. They gather it up on Passover meal, and then they burn it. They literally, every single year, gather up all the things that are symbols of sin, the yeast, the leaven in our lives that can infect all the rest of our lives. They take it, and they burn it. They get rid of it every single year. And I think that that's a, one of the best things about the season of Lent. If we do it right... We are supposed to look at our own lives and say, what is it, God, that you want to drive out of my life? What is it that you want to purify? So undoubtedly, there were some people who would have seen Jesus doing this and were convicted by the Holy Spirit. I mean, I don't think Jesus just does things for no reason. He does, doesn't uh, do things thinking nobody's going to change, but undoubtedly there were people that were changed by these instances of Jesus clearing out the temple, and undoubtedly there would be people who probably thought of the Old Testament scriptures, just as the disciples remembered that, uh, that the Messiah was to be zealous for his house. And there are undoubtedly some people who thought about Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, which says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver." and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. See, God's design is not for us. His desire is not to take us as sinful beings and throw us into the fire. He doesn't want to cast us completely out of his presence, never to come back, but he is wanting to refine us. Through that process where Jesus was cleaning the temple, through the process of how the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, God's desire is that we become more holy, that we become refined, more useful to God's kingdom. So going back to John 2, 12 through 25, we'll pick it back up in 22. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. 
But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. So Jesus didn't need them, it says. And that's something that I think we also need to realize, too. God does not need us. He does not need to use us. Sometimes we might think, oh, I'm going to do God a favor by going to church on Sunday. Or I'm going to do God a favor by doing this kind thing for my neighbor. That completely takes, uh, it puts our focus in the wrong place. It's the same problem that those money changers had at the beginning of the story. They were focusing on what? On themselves. And so we need to realize that God doesn't actually need to use us. He is sovereign. He can do anything he wants. But on the other hand, God takes delight in using us when we are willing vessels. If we are willing to allow Jesus to redeem us, he will take delight in using us. See, that's the whole point of these stories of Jesus cleaning the temple. It's not that he wanted to uh, punish and judge each and every person that was in there. He wanted to convict them, certainly, but he came back every single year and he eventually, the final time, went to the cross for the very people who were seeking to punish him, to destroy him, to kill him. Just as, uh, just as it was saying in uh, Mark chapter 11, that the chief priests and the scribes, they were seeking a way to destroy him. Jesus died even for them. Jesus died even for each and every one of us. But it's not enough just to know that. We have to admit, believe, and choose to follow him. And when we do that, he takes delight in using us. And just as we were looking at James, uh, the book of James, a couple of series ago here at this church, James 1.27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And a lot of commentators talk about how part of the problem with the temple at that time is there was all these people that came to the temple for their own profit, but there were people right outside the temple, orphans and widows, that were crying out for help. And the money changers and the sacrificial animal um, sellers, they walked right past them. In the same way, we today, there's a lot of need, especially during this time of COVID. All of us probably know people in great need. God's desire is not for us to just walk right by them. But if we have allowed Jesus and the Holy Spirit to come into our lives and to clean house, to make us more like him, then he takes delight in using us to love God and to love others, having our focus be worshiping God and building his kingdom rather than our own selves. So I'm going to leave you with the final lectionary text for the day. 1 Corinthians 1, chapter, sorry, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demanded signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let us pray. 
Dear Father God, I thank you for the cross. I thank you for how you willingly laid your life down for us, even though you did not have to. We did not deserve it, but you loved us so much. You gave us a chance. You loved us so much that you gave us these examples of cleaning out the temple, and Lord, that you want us to clean out our lives to become more like you. Lord, I pray that you would make us more useful servants, Lord, that we wouldn't be focusing on ourselves, but we'd be focusing on you and how we can share the gospel message with the lost and hurting world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We'll call upon the Moravian Choir for the closing song at this time. covenant book of worship. May the grace of Christ, which daily renews us, and the love of God, which enables us to love all, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, which unites us in one body, make us eager to obey the will of God until we meet again. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs>